Enter, rejoice, and come in, or enter, rejoice, and log in if you're joining us on Zoom. We are so glad you are here. We come together by the light of our chalice flame. If you are joining us from home, we invite you to light a candle or a chalice along with us as we say the words that we say each week together to light our flaming chalice. We light this flame as a symbol of new life, enlightening our way, as a symbol of the warmth in every human heart. Let the lighting of this flame rekindle in us the inner light of hope, of peace, of love. May we share that light with all people. Good morning. My name is Greg Weaver. I've been a UU for 30 years and started attending here in 2019. I plugged in here by serving on the audit committee and by volunteering to help lead this morning's service. <laughs> I was celebrating behind you. <laughs> Many years ago, when I attended my first Sunday morning UU service, I knew very little about them on that first Sunday. That very morning, I happened to pick up a small pamphlet which described six sources of living tradition and seven UU principles. I remember thinking as I read those for the first time, this feels like coming home. And I so admired the brevity of that little pamphlet. And as a newcomer, I just automatically assumed that the UUs were a, fee a people of very few words. <laughs> <laughs> so, many years and many words later, I've stayed connected because I believe the UUs have something vital to offer, a loving liberal light offered to a world that really needs more loving liberal light. So this morning, it's a joy to welcome all of you to a celebration of that light. And if this is your first time attending the fellowship, we all offer a special warm welcome to you. We'd love to help you get connected here. After the service, you can talk to members of our engagement team who wear rainbow lanyards, or you can speak to members of our staff or email staff using the contact information on our website. Two quick reminders, exits are located to your left, right, and behind you and please remember to silence your phones. Now it's time to settle in. Take a deep breath. Become aware of your body wherever you are. Allow yourself to be fully present to this time together. We're so glad you're here. Today, our call to gather is from the hymnal written by UU minister Kathleen McTeague. We come together this morning to remind one another to rest for a moment on the forming edge of our lives, to resist the headlong tumble into the next moment until we claim for ourselves awareness and gratitude 
taking the time to look into one another's faces and see their communion, the reflection of our own eyes. This house of laughter and silence, memory and hope is hollowed by our presence together. Today we're exploring how understandings of God evolve, and we're reflecting on how we find meaning in our lives. Perhaps the concept of God is a part of your spiritual life, perhaps it is not. Whatever your spiritual life consists of, we welcome you here. We are glad that you are with us in this faith community of many beliefs. One of the foundations of our faith is generosity. We take time each week to practice this foundation, to strengthen our ability to give as we are able and to receive when we are in need. If you are ever in need of emotional or spiritual or financial support, we are here for you. Please do not hesitate to reach out to myself It is a joy for me to be able to offer help on behalf of this beloved community. And if you're someone who is feeling stable and able to give, we ask that you do so in that spirit of generosity. There are many ways to give to the fellowship. You can give of your time and your talent, and we especially do need financial resources to allow our ministries to thrive for the months and the years to come. So if you are here in our building, please feel free to come up to one of our ushers who are standing in the back of the sanctuary, or you can raise your hand and an usher will come to you. For anyone, we also encourage you to donate online or via our text to give function on a smartphone. Thank you. Your gifts are greatly appreciated. Another part of our commitment to each other is to bring our joys and our concerns to this time together. Taking time to honor the joys, concerns, and transitions in our lives allows us to share with each other so that our joys might feel multiplied and our sorrows divided. In a moment, we will share the joys and concerns that have been submitted to us by people in our circle of care. And if you are joining us on Zoom, you can also share in the chat box any joy or concern or prayer request or intention that might be on your heart and on your mind. We also invite anyone here in the building after the service to join a member of our care team in the back of the sanctuary by the bowl of stones if you are in need of a listening presence. For care and connection during the week, please reach out to myself or contact our office. 
And if you'd like to include your news in our spoken joys and concerns or in our email, you can call or contact anyone on staff or fill out our website form. We now turn our attention to the joys and concerns that are wider than this gathered community. We allow our mind and our heart to reach out in ever widening circles outward like ripples in water. With our first stone today, we honor Juneteenth. We celebrate the liberation of America from the horrific violence of chattel slavery. We remember the enslaved people in Galveston, Texas, the last place in the Confederate States to receive enforcement of the Emancipation Proclamation. We remember the Union soldiers, many of whom were black, who traveled through the Confederate States to bring that proclamation. We celebrate the significance of this holiday, especially for black communities in our country. We continue to commit ourselves to accountably dismantling racism and all forms of slavery and white supremacy still present today. We add another stone today for Father's Day. As we lift up the fathers in our circle of care, our circles of care and those who have served in fathering roles, we also honor the complexities of the day. We celebrate the fathers and father figures among us who have loved and nurtured us into being. We mourn with those among us who have lost a father and fathers among us who have lost a child. We hold in our hearts those of us who've experienced separation or estrangement between a father and a child. We celebrate with fathers among us who once never thought being a father would be possible because of sexuality or gender. We grieve with those of us in communities where the prison bars of mass incarceration separate fathers from their families. We lift up those among us redefining fatherhood in beautiful ways. We hold all fathering relationships and circumstances tenderly in love, care, and compassion. We enfold all who are celebrating and all who are suffering in the embrace of our hearts, and we commit ourselves to acts of compassion and justice in service to those circles beyond our own. May this moment of silence help make it so. Our settling song is number 83 in the gray hymnal, Winds Be Still. Feel free to stand if you prefer. The, the words will be on the screen or in the book.
Our first reading this morning is from Agnostic, A Spirited Manifesto by Leslie Hazelton. The absence of an ultimate meaning in, of life, a grand overarching explanation of everything, does not render life empty of relevance. On the contrary, it makes life more relevant. It means we can no longer use divine intent as an excuse. It places responsibility directly on us. Responsibility for how we act, for what we do, for our relations with others, with our society, with our planet. It is we who determine meaning by what we do. I see no reason why meaning and significance should be any less for knowing how vast the universe is and how small I am in it. Far from being appalled by this, I am excited by it. It allows for life as an adventure and for the unexpected and underappreciated value of misadventure. Instead of what's the meaning of life, then, I'd rather ask what makes life, what makes my life meaningful? Instead of mission, I'm happy to wake up in anticipation of a new day with work I want to return to, people I want to walk and talk with. Happy, that is, to wake up with desire, with appetite, and with the bemused acceptance of being human. The search for meaning, then, is itself a choice. It offers the hope of a consoling narrative that will stave off the awareness of an indifferent universe. It's the go-to defense against the fear of insignificance, against the realization that there's nothing personal in nature. That it's not about me or you or us, and that whatever narrative we detect in it is entirely of our own making. This morning you'll hear mention of the word God a bit more often than you might hear on an average Sunday here. Some of us are cautious about God talk, myself included. But in the sermon, I'd like to share a bit about my journey from Christian monotheist to unaffiliated atheist to UU agnostic. And to do that with your kind, permission, a little bit of God talk is needed. So with that, the second reading is from Eat, Pray, Love by Elizabeth Gilbert, from the part of the book where the author was a meditation student living full time at an Indian ashram. The Indians around here tell a cautionary fable about a great saint who was always surrounded in his ashram by loyal devotees. For hours a day, the saint and his followers would meditate on God. The only problem was the saint had a young cat, an annoying creature who used to walk through the temple meowing and purring and bothering everyone during meditation. So the saint, in all his practical wisdom, commanded that the cat be tied to a pole outside for a few hours a day, only during meditation, so as not to disturb anyone. This became a habit, tying the cat to the pole, then meditating on God. But as years passed, the habit hardened into religious ritual. Nobody could meditate unless the cat was tied to the pole first. <laughs> then one day, the cat died. The saint's followers were panic-stricken. It was a major religious crisis. How could they meditate now without a cat to tie to the pole? How would they reach God? 
In their minds, the cat had become the means. Be very careful, warns this tale, not to get too obsessed with the repetition of religious ritual just for its own sake, especially in this divided world where the Taliban and the Christian coalition continue to fight out their international trademark war over who owns the rights to the word God and who has the proper rituals to reach that God, it may be useful to remember that it is not the tying of the cat to the pole that has ever brought anyone to transcendence. Flexibility is just as essential for divinity as is discipline. Your job then, should you choose to accept it, is to keep searching for the metaphors, rituals, and teachers that help you move ever closer to divinity. The yogic scriptures say that God responds to the prayers and efforts of human beings in any way whatsoever that mortals choose to worship, just so long as those prayers are sincere. As one line from the Upanishads suggests, people follow different paths, straight or crooked, according to their temperament, and all reach you, just as all rivers enter the ocean. Thank you.
I was home on fall break during my freshman year of college, and my mom and I were out together at our local Panera Bread. I remember every detail of this coffee date. I remember the exact booth that we sat in. I remember the muffin that we shared between us. I remember the sweet mocha latte in front of me because I hadn't learned to drink real coffee yet. I remember it all so vividly, so vividly because I was nervous. I had something that I wanted to talk with my mom about, but it was the kind of conversation that for me took some courage. It was the kind of conversation that had some, some shame laced into it. As we sat there, my mom could tell that something was bothering me. Sweetie, what's wrong? She asked. I burst into tears before I could even get the words out. She reached for my hand, patiently waiting for me to speak. I don't think I believe in God, I said. Her face visibly relaxed into gentle compassion. My mom was relieved. With the way I had been crying, she had been worried that I was dropping out of school or that I was pregnant or both. <laughs> this felt much more manageable to her. But for me, this conversation, it felt like a huge deal. Many of you know that both of my parents were Presbyterian ministers. I grew up steeped in a Christian church. It was an inextricable part of my family's DNA. And I loved that. I loved it. I had such a great experience in the churches of my childhood. I, I loved the people. I loved the traditions. I loved that I got to be a part of a loving and caring community, and I loved the thoughtful and heartfelt messages that I heard my parents preach about from the pulpit. Even so, I had questions about what we believed and why we believed it. And I had these questions for a long time, but with church being so integral to my family's life, I felt scared to ask them. I was worried about what my theological doubts said about me. I was worried about how they might affect my relationship with my family. And so I kept quiet until I felt it bubbling up in me in that Panera bread that morning. I don't think I believe in God, I confessed. My mom answered with such tenderness, such compassion. With her hand holding mine, she looked me in the eyes and she gave me this gentle invitation. Tell me about the God you don't believe in. Chances are I don't believe in that God either. My mom doesn't take credit for this response. She later told me she was quoting other wise ministers who she'd heard respond this way to similar confessions of disbelief. But boy, was this the response I didn't know I needed. I needed that invitation to make sense of the idea of God on my own terms to let go of all the baggage that the word God can hold. My mom and I then talked for hours about her experience of God and her spiritual journey. And I felt the gates opening to me, feeling a newfound sense of permission to make meaning with this concept of God in ways that could possibly be enriching to my spiritual life. 
rather than restricting, as I had thought before. For me right now, sometimes I feel drawn to use the word God. Sometimes I don't. Sometimes it feels good to have a word that points toward an experience of existence that is so huge and so transcendent and so intimate and deep and unknowable. Sometimes it feels unhelpful to even try and name that. Now when someone asks me if I believe in God, a no or a yes feels insufficient. Do I believe in God? Well, that depends. What is God? Thank you for that beautiful reflection. One day, completely out of the blue, my eight-year-old daughter asked me, Daddy, do you believe in God? Gulp. (laughs) Right then, my entire undergrad religion major, all the theology, philosophy, and sophistry flashed in front of my mind's eye in a split second. My daughter didn't know that I was raised in a small German Protestant group, and when I was her age, I was encouraged to believe that an ageless white male with a flowing white beard sat on a colossal throne somewhere above the universe, constantly judging my every thought and action, prepared 24-7 to strike me down with a lightning bolt if I strayed even slightly from his divine plan. Picture Zeus with an irritable German temperament. (laughs) When I finished the religion degree, I was accepted at a seminary. My plan was to earn a master's in divinity in three years, then go into Christian ministry. But you already know, things often don't work as planned. Over that summer, it dawned on me that I had no business starting seminary that fall. You see, the religion degree had taught me how to question everything. Doubt had whispered, if you believe something and it wasn't true, how would you know that? Doubt had torn down my entire Christian faith. And when that faith structure was leveled to the ground, doubt drilled down to what I thought was bedrock. I doubted the very idea of God. At 22, I realized I did not want to be in a Protestant pulpit at age 25, trying to lead a congregation closer to a God whose very existence I doubted. I thought somehow that might lack integrity. (laughs) It didn't take long before the other shoe dropped and I left that Protestant group too. Looking back now, I am so grateful that I didn't give up on the search for meaning at that young age. Much of the credit for that goes to the Unitarian Universalist Fellowship of Elkhart, Indiana. This was back in the pre-Google era when we found things in a thick book that some of you will remember called the Yellow Pages. I'm a Yellow Page UU. We are a small and typically gray-haired subgroup. Before I attended my first UU service, all I knew about them from their yellow page entry was their funny sounding name and a street address. I was a little bit nervous not knowing quite what to expect and in my nervousness I almost turned into the Pentecostal church down the street by mistake. If 
I had, I would have never recovered from my first impression of the UUs. <laughs> but I found the right place in more ways than one. Most importantly, I found fellow seekers. I found a place where my doubts about God weren't judged. They were given a safe space. And in that safe space, I let go of whatever was left of the image of God as a noun, as a being. That's just a metaphor, after all. Never meant to be taken literally. And I opened to the idea, at least, of God as a verb, being, with a capital B. Thirty years later, after pondering a lot of great UU sermons, I've come to three tentatively firm conclusions about the meaning of meaning, and I'd like to share those now. First, I suspect, but cannot know for sure, that the universe just is, and it does not come to us with built-in meaning. That's a big one, so let me repeat. I suspect, but cannot know for sure, that the universe just is, and it does not come to us with a built-in meaning. Second, however, that's not to say life lacks meaning, because everywhere I look, I see vast systems of meaning, many of them claiming to have a direct line to the divine. I suspect, but cannot know for sure, that we didn't receive any revelation from above, that instead we humans composed and remixed all of our meaning systems. And we did so out of a deep hunger to find satisfying answers to the three enormous existential questions of life. Where do we come from? Why are we here? And what happens when we die? If you buy the twin ideas that on the one hand, the universe probably doesn't come to you with a built-in meaning just waiting to be revealed, and on the other hand, you hunger for meaning, knowing that healthy meaning in your life is like oxygen in your lungs. Then you've probably already started what you use call a free and responsible search for truth and meaning. It's a free search because you do not have to ask for, perm for permission to start your search. And the answers are not predetermined. Third, I suspect, but cannot know for sure, that everything we know, the entire island of all human knowledge, is like a microscopic dot in a nearly infinite ocean of what is knowable. I got a reminder of that from a PBS program on how telescopes changed in the past century. When Edwin Hubble started his research, it was common belief that our Milky Way was the one and only galaxy. We were off by just a tad. <laughs> a century later, with the help of his namesake space telescope, astronomers estimate, and underline that word estimate, that there are two trillion galaxies out there, each with an average 100 billion stars. That's two followed by 23 zeros, meaning more stars like our sun out there than every grain of sand on every beach and in every desert of our tiny blue boat home. And if that's not humbling enough, they think dark energy and dark matter to concepts which balance the equations, but scientists admit they barely understand, account for 95% of the universe. On that point, one of the astronomers said, it's as if our planet 
was 95% covered by oceans and we didn't understand the properties of water. Clearly, there's plenty of room for the shoreline of our tiny volcanic island of knowledge to grow. In the meantime, what I know deep in my heart is that whatever meaning map I navigate life with, that map will never be anything more than a tiny scale model of a much bigger reality. Intellectual humility seems like a wise response. After all, if we can be off by two trillion galaxies, what other seemingly obvious beliefs might we doubt? These days, I self-identify as a humanist agnostic who has strong spiritual and skeptical sides. One part of me has a deep sense of mystery and wonder. I have a sense that even though we're each just one drop in the ocean of life, we're connected to the energy of the ocean and we are connected to each other. Another part of me, however, thinks it's obvious that nothing is obvious. <laughs> so if you drill down deep enough on any meaning system, religious, scientific, political, eventually you get to the foundational assumptions. Those are the ones that can't be proven or disproven. Here's an example of one type of religious foundational assumption. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. No matter what you think about that, the odds of that, no one can prove or definitively disprove that statement. But so much of what we think we know about God is passed down as petrified tradition, like the fable of the cat we heard earlier. That's why you use advocate the direct experience of transcending mystery and wonder, because the indirect stuff passed down by tradition since back when most people thought the earth was flat, that's all informative at best. So I long ago decided silence is one of the very best things I have to say about God. Apparently my daughter had heard that silence loud and clear. It's ironic, my parents talked way too much to their children about God. And somewhat in reaction to that, I had talked way too little about God to my only child. In that moment, I was reminded how much we can be shaped by an idea that we react against. All this flashed in front of my mind's eye in a split second. Then in true religion major style, my next thought was, do I believe in God? That depends entirely on what you mean by God. Define your terms. <laughs> but then in a fortunate moment of parental clarity, I remembered that I was chatting with an eight-year-old. <laughs> She was bright, she gets that from her mother, and she was intuitive. I have a gut feeling that she got that from me. But she saw the world in age-appropriate, concrete terms. She did not want sophistry or fancy words like reification. She just wanted an answer from someone she loved and trusted. So when my daughter asked if her daddy believed in God, on a hunch, I decided not to give her a long-winded lecture about humanity's long search for meaning. Instead, I wanted to encourage her search. So I reduced all those swirling thoughts down to a warm smile and, sure, sweetie, how about you? 
Yeah, she said, there must have been someone around to create the first human. I pondered that for a moment, then asked her, but who created God? I could see the spark in her mind. No one, she said, God was always around out of the mouths of babes. A few years later, in her early teens, one day my daughter announced, I am a UU. Hearing her self-identify with our meaning system flooded me with two powerful emotions. The first was joyous gratitude for the yellow pages <laughs> and, and for the journey. The second was hope. Hope that with the help of the UUs, she and many other seekers like her would grow into a more curious and compassionate understanding of God, however she chooses to define that verb. This day and every day, may our lives be filled with healthy meaning. Blessed be and amen. Please rise for our closing hymn, which is Blue Boat Home. It's in the Teal Hymnal 1064, or the words will be on the screen.
Our time together is coming to a close, which means our time to return to the world and to our daily lives is beginning. Remember that there are always ways to get connected here, even online, and to live your faith more fully. I want to give a really big thanks this morning to Jack Maxim, our pianist today. Thank you, Jack. Thank you. And thank you to Mary for leading our hymns, Mary Gerlach. And I also want to lift up our guest preacher, Greg Weaver. Thank you so much, Greg. Please be sure to read our weekly scroll e-newsletter, or let us know if you'd like to be added to that mailing list, and check out the order of service, especially on the back, for some highlights about what's coming up. And now we invite you to consider something from today's service that you want to carry with you away from this gathering and into your week. Perhaps it's a phrase, a topic, a song, maybe something else. It's our sincere hope that it will provide inspiration and empowerment for you until we are together again. And now, please join me in our unison words for extinguishing our chalice flame, even as we continue to hold its warmth and light in our hearts. As we extinguish this flame, let us go our ways with hope in our hearts, with our spirits renewed, and with a deeper understanding of life's mystery. Let us carry the light of compassion and commitment to build a better world. And with that, go with healthy meaning, moving you to joy and to service. Go in peace, knowing we wait to embrace you upon your return. Mm -hmm.